introduce our speaker, I'd like to introduce Chuck Kyle, St. Ignatius High School class of 1969, longtime football and track coach. Introduce Al. Thank you, Chuck. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I send my grades for my seventh period English class. They are entering the room right now going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised they're, they're just, they, they, they are looking, not looking forward to my wonderful presentation on supporting clauses. Right? <laughs> Today we have a wonderful guest speaker, a man who's a great representative of what the Jesuit Commission can do in education. Provide for you in the future. Uh, Oliver Luck, Jesu Parish, all right, by John Carroll University, St. Ignatius High School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gee, the Bulldogs are everywhere. <laughs> Came to St. Ignatius High School, an excellent uh, football, basketball player, received the uh, Touchdown Club Award in his senior year as the best player in Cleveland. And uh, inspiring, of course, is that all along, first honors going through high school. Received an NCAA Division I scholarship at West Virginia University. Uh, and really, to be honest with you, you college historians, if you look back, Oliver Luck put the West Virginia's football back on the uh, When Don Dealing came, and uh, he's a legendary name down there in West Virginia. They got a road named after him now. I noticed that just about a month ago. And it's uh, God coming in and Oliver leaving to the Peach Bowl against Florida. And then from that point on, West Virginia's been a powerhouse. So Drafted in the second round with the uh, Houston Oilers. Uh, played four years. I, I have four students that I brought along to do our captain class. Our, our captain's coming up for this year. And I, I really want them to listen very carefully because uh, I Brett, in the second round, I sure you did a pretty good signing bonus. A good contract. He played four years with the Houston Oilers. So what did he do in his spare time? He got his law degree from the University of Texas. How about that? I mean, the pro football player spend their time and money doing various things. Talk about putting his energies to good use. Uh, after football, he did continue with the NFL. The world football league was in existence. The NFL wanted to keep the, the good news about football spreading throughout the world, right? And so Oliver was involved in the world football league first in Frankfurt. He then became the, the I, I would say, the CEO of the world football league. And then from there, uh, came back to Houston and uh, was the chief executive of the sports authority uh, involved with them. One billion dollar sports complex of all the, all the sports teams in Houston, basically. He spearheaded all of that. Uh, certainly, his, uh, his alma mater uh, in the state of West Virginia desired him to come back and help out there, which he did. Uh, joined the Board of Governors at West Virginia University, and then uh, that was cut short because he accepted the job of being the athletic director at West Virginia University. Paid attention to all the going on of NCAA football and sports. Uh, what a wonderful contribution he had without the luxury involved because the integrity uh, that was so deep and the development down there in West Virginia uh, of their complex fundraising. He told me earlier today, it's what he spends a lot of time doing. You know, I always picture an athletic director making sure you have enough volleyballs and enough uniforms, right? What about making you know, a few million dollars for this, a million dollars for that. But in, in the end, uh, I, again, I, I, I really was eager to bring our four young boys here with us today. Because what we're going to hear today, I, I'm convinced of this, is how the Jesuit tradition of work ethic, of faith, you know, of persistence, it is a confirmation of the need of that. And where do we get that? Certainly, I think everybody in this room realizes what the Jesuit tradition is. At the stem of everything is your faith. But again, because of that faith, you have that persistence and you have that good effort. That makes all the difference in the world. So it is certainly a pleasure to introduce to you Oliver Luck. Oliver.
Well, thank you and good afternoon. Please feel free to dig in and eat. Uh, Chuck, I will say one thing. The easy way to describe the 10 years that I spent in Europe with my family working for the NFL, I was doing missionary work, Father Murphy. <laughs> in the truest sense of the Jesuit tradition, missionary work. So it's, it's really an honor to be here. I'm humbled to see so many friendly faces uh, going all the way back to Jesu, class of 74, right, John? Uh, so the only person I, I, I feel obligated to and honored to introduce is my mother, right? Gisela Luck. that my mother was born and raised in Germany. Came over to the U.S. in the late 50s. When we asked her, Mom, right, you remember this? When we asked her, my older brother Chris and I, he's Ignatius class of 76, when we asked her, Mom, why did you leave your home country and come over to the U.S.? The response was, well, boys, I wanted to get married. All the German men my age were either dead or were missing important body parts. <laughs> So I want you to acknowledge the courage it took to get on the boat in Hamburg and move over to the U.S. So, as Chuck Kyle mentioned, I'm the athletic director of West Virginia, the AD. When I'm in the great state of West Virginia, I'm the AD, athletic director. If I'm in any of the other 49 states, AD means Andrew's dad. So just get that established. Uh, a quick housekeeping note before I, I get started, and I won't speak all that long. I know folks have, have timelines. Uh, but uh, if you need to leave, please feel free to do so. Uh, I played on a really bad Oilers team one year. We were 2-14, and 14, and I remember people leaving the Astrodome in the first quarter, second quarter, <laughs> third quarter. So if you need to get up and leave, don't, don't worry about that at all. It is a, a real honor you know, to be here. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's great to visit with old classmates from Ignatius or even going back to Jesu. And, reawakens all these old memories that we have of our time at St. Ignatius High School and, and before that and even uh, sometimes we spent together in college. And I'm always blessed because people say, oh gosh, I remember watching you play football in the city championship game or watching the Marty Chambers coached basketball team win across the street at Public Hall against some of the great East Senate teams in those uh, city championship games. Uh, but. What makes me humble is to think about my most embarrassing moment as a football player, and I'd like to share that with you. So, I was down in Houston, and I was a backup quarterback. I actually played five years, Coach Kyle. And I had to get the pension. <laughs> Good union guy. So, uh, I played five years, and primarily I was a backup to Warren Moon, one of the great uh, quarterbacks in the NFL. He's in the Hall of Fame, first African-American quarterback, I think, to be inducted in the Hall of Fame, and a good friend of mine. And every now and then Warren would, would get banged up or get hurt or whatever, and I got to play in the game. So we were playing a game against the old Buffalo Bills, and they were pretty good when they were going to those Super Bowls. And I dropped back to pass, and I got sacked from behind. As often happens to football players, as we know today, I got a concussion. Team doctors took me out of the game, sent me over to the Texas Medical Center right next to the Astrodome. And the next morning, in the old Houston Post, the headline read, Luck Suffers Concussion, comma. Brain examined, comma, nothing found. <laughs> and at that point, my father, since deceased, who was a chemical engineer for DuPont for many years, my father, who did not like lawyers, said, that will qualify you to go to law school. <laughs> There's so many lawyers in the Ignatius community, it's great, right? So, when John Fitzgerald and, and Michael called me, Michael Leonakis called me, I don't know when it was, guys, a couple months ago, and asked me if I'd be interested in, in speaking to the Loyola Club. I said, absolutely. And they said, well, you know, we'd like you to talk about what the Ignatian education, the Jesuit education meant to you. And that forced me to do something which I'm really not very good at, which is to sort of be introspective, right? Uh, and it was a very good lesson, and I appreciate the opportunity to do that because it forced me to think about the 35 years, class of 78 guys, the 35 years that have passed since we graduated from a, a great high school. I had a chance to go down to Houston and play in the NFL for a little bit, and spend 10 years in Europe, and marry a beautiful woman from Houston, whom I met, whom I met in law school at the University of Texas, and 
raise a family and come back and live in Houston and build stadiums in Texas and go up to West Virginia to, to work on on uh, improving the athletic fortunes of, of my college. So I've had some marvelous, marvelous experiences, but I can trace a lot of those back to St. Ignatius. Uh, although, quite honestly, after four years of high school, I had no desire to continue my Jesuit education. I'll never forget when I went in to see Father Broom, who was the college counselor at St. Ignatius. The Broom Closet, remember that, Mike Sweeney? And Father Broom only had brochures from Jesuit colleges. <laughs> and when I told Father Broom, when I broke the news to him that I was going to school in West Virginia, he said, oh, you'll love Wheeling Jesuit, Oliver. I said, no, Father, I'm going to Morgantown. But I've had all these tremendous opportunities, and I think many of those really go back to the training that I received for four years at San Ignatio. So without being, without being too trite, I'd like to share how my four years at Ignatius has helped me do what I'm doing now in the world of college athletics. Many of you follow college athletics. We talked about it this morning to the level of executive board. There's not an industry in today's country, today's society, that's changing more than college athletics. On the one hand, College sports, particularly football and basketball, more popular than ever. Stadiums are filled up. There's more money being spent. Final Four is more popular than ever. Great TV ratings. You go down to watch a Buckeye game or Penn State or any of the big state school stadiums are packed. Right. So on the one hand, things couldn't be better, the best of times. But on the other hand, there's the worst of times. Many of you have followed the unionization push at Northwestern, a private school. The football players there have filed with the National Labor Relations Board to be recognized as a union. Not a novel approach, but you got to give those Northwestern kids credit. Uh, there's a major lawsuit against the NCAA out on the West Coast in the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco Federal Court. Uh, the basic claim is that the NCAA and all the colleges and universities have conspired to violate antitrust laws and have not allowed student athletes to use and take advantage of their name, image, and likeness. Big federal court case, the O'Bannon case, in case you're following it, fellow attorneys. There's another lawsuit followed by a very, very prominent sport, sports plaintiff attorney, Jeffrey Kessler, uh, alleging that the NCAA and the colleges have capped the value of a scholarship. Uh, in violation of the Sherman and, and Clayton Antitrust Acts. There's lawsuits about concussions that are taking place. So in my industry, probably very similar to your industry, lots of tumultuous times, lots of, lots of challenges for athletic directors, for college presidents, for the commissioners of all these conferences. On top of that, there's a very strong movement towards the 65 big schools those are the schools and the five so-called power conferences, the Pac-12, the Big Ten, the Big 12, the ACC, and the SEC. There are 65 schools, and that includes Notre Dame for y'all. Don't worry about Notre Dame, they're in the mix. Those schools are asking the NCAA for greater autonomy to do more or less what they want to do under the umbrella of the NCAA. So you're seeing the biggest 65 schools move towards a level of autonomy that's really been unprecedented in the history of the NCAA. So there's all these different issues that we're dealing with in college sports, and much like I'm sure your industries, there, there are some challenging times. I believe the four years that I spent in Ignatius have prepared me very well to deal with all of that gray matter. Right? As we get older, this is a lesson for our our Fort Ignatius students here, I know there's some other kids from schools around the, the city. As we get older, you realize things really aren't black and white anymore. There's a lot of gray matter. And to make proper judgments, you need to have a proper foundation and proper discretion. And that's, I think, what one of the things that the Ignatius community has done so well for the thousands of young men that have come through. But as I sit back and think about my industry, college athletics, we kind of think that the barbarians are at the gates. Right? And we have to think of how we structure this to be fair to all the parties involved. I think of three or four things that I learned as an Ignatius student that carried with me, carried me today where I am and have stayed with me for a long, long time. The first is very simple, but an incredibly optimistic approach to life 
which is finding God in everything. The Ignatius community, the Jesuit community, is engaged. It is not detached, never has been, never will be. That's what's special about the Ignatian spirit. It's an engaged community. I remember when we were students, Mike, John, all the guys here, we did our service. We were in tough parts of West Cleveland, downtown. Brutal parts, right? A whole new world opened up for those of us that grew up relatively comfortably in the suburbs. So the Ignatian approach is to be involved, engaged with reality. And as you do that, as you deal with people, as you deal with the ups and downs, the good and the bad, right? The yin and the yang. You have to learn, I believe, to find God, to find truth, to find beauty in every little thing. The Ignatians taught us that. Doesn't matter where we go, I think, as Ignatius students, as Jesuit trained individuals, we can find truth, beauty, in other words, God, in every little thing, whether it's a musical performance, whether it's a smile on a kid's face, or just fun in to get to first base. It doesn't matter what it is, we find God in every little thing. Marty Chambers found God in boxing out. <laughs> Sweeney found God, I think, in making a great jump shot. But there's beauty in all these things that we do, and that's that's very important. That's something I believe I learned at Ten Ignatius that's helped me carry through. A common phrase we're all very familiar with is men serving others. And I think the Ignatian ethos, the Jesuit ethos, is to really hammer that in to the students. If you look around, again, Ignatians, Jesuit trained folks who are engaged in the community, no matter what we're doing, politics, business, law, whatever it may be, we're very much engaged in the community. And we build our circles of colleagues and influencers to have influence, to have success, to create a better world. Right? I think, Mom, you told me that uh, you, you, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Maybe that was a West Virginia phrase I learned in college. But Ignatians are tremendous at building networks and working with folks who want to see us improve, who want to see the world improve. Again, that's that engagement with our communities, with our society. I think that's hugely important. That's something that's helped me. You know, no man is an island. There's no way to accomplish anything without working with others. I think I learned Coach Kyle is a football player at Ignatius. He's a basketball player playing for Marty Chambers, for Dale DeBoer. Uh, for all the other coaches there, you know, we learn never let down the guy to your left or to your right, right? Uh, you, may let, you might let down a coach, that's okay, they're adults, they don't really matter that much, but boy, you would never, Rory Hennessy, let down one of your teammates, right? When you're tired, you didn't want to go to practice, and coach was yelling at you, even though Marty always kept his voice very low. <laughs> When you were tired, you had, you know, you were worried about your girlfriend or the AP Latin exam coming up or whatever it may be, right? The coach didn't motivate you. I thought what motivated us all was not letting down the guy to our left or that guy to our right. And that's a really a strong work ethic that I think has, has really made a, a stark impression on almost all Jesuit trained folks. Something else that I can only credit, I think, the Jesuits for is teaching us intellectual nimbleness, teaching us intellectual agility. I'm a history major, and I like to take the long-term view of things, right? Which is hard in today's, you know, make it happen now society. I kind of, I kind of think a little bit like Mao Zedong. He was asked one time in the 1970s, Mr. Mao Zedong. What do you think of the French Revolution? French Revolution? And his response was, too early to tell. That's the long-term view of things. But if we take the long-term view of things, I think one of the things that the Jesuit community has done so well, and you would expect this, quite honestly, because they are the preeminent educators within the church, you would expect this. One thing they've done so well is they have synthesized the most significant intellectual debate that has taken place over the last 400 years, and that's faith versus reason. Right? Faith versus reason. Probably every Christian, every Catholic has struggled with that at some point. Right? Science, I'm the son of a chemical engineer and a chemist, right? Science has created a great society, a great world for us. The Jesuit community has embraced 
They've embraced that. They've had their challenges along the way. There's many great Jesuit thinkers who rock the boat a little bit in the great Jesuit tradition, whether it's Pierre Chardin or others, that have synthesized this really tumultuous and challenging intellectual debate about faith versus reason. And I believe the Jesuits have done that very well. I believe not only has that kept them relevant as educators in this country, I believe that's kept them at the very tip, the very apex of education within the Catholic Church. That they've embraced science, they've embraced the empirical method without abandoning whatsoever faith. And I think as a tribute to that, we have Francis I, the first Jesuit Pope. So I think about that all the time because I think it is the most significant intellectual debate in the Western world for the last 400 years. And I think about that today as I read the news about another problem in the Islamic world. We've got all kind of hot spots around the country. Right? The Islamic world is, is on the, in the vanguard, if you will. Lots of growth demographically in the Islamic world. And as I look at some of the things that are happening, whether it's in sub-Saharan Africa, or in the Middle East, or the subcontinental India, I think to myself, they haven't had that debate yet. They haven't had that reasoned debate between faith and reason, between faith and science, between faith and civilization. We've had that debate, and I credit the Jesuits for leading that debate with many of the great thinkers they've had. And that has helped all of us, the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of us who have attended Jesuit schools and have been able to take advantage of that uh, and remain strong to the church and strong Catholics and strong supporters of the Jesuit tradition and at the same time embrace modern society of the 21st century. The last thing that I believe has been a real blessing for me and I think again thousands of others uh, who have been trained by the Jesuits is the courage that the Jesuits give their students. And this isn't really physical courage. Right? We get that from playing football or basketball. I got that from Father O'Reilly. Remember Father O'Reilly, guys? My first day on campus as a hotshot quarterback from Jesu Elementary School as a freshman, Father O'Reilly grabbed me, took me around a corner, and just punched me right in the gut. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, Father, what do they do? I just got here. Oh. And he said to me, he looked at me and said, they told me you're tough. <laughs> and then he walked off. <laughs> Over four years, I gravitated towards Father Welsh because he would never do that. He's much more gentle. But there's a mental courage that I believe the Jesuits provide us. I had the chance, as I mentioned earlier, to, to spend 10 years living over in Europe, and we traveled a lot, and I was traveling a lot on business, and as I was over there, I would try to sort of touch base with the Jesuit community. If I was in Barcelona, I'd take a side trip and go to Manresa, where Ignatius did his spiritual exercises. I spent time in uh, Pamplona, in the Basque country. In fact, we spent a lot of time in both the Spanish and the French Basque country on, on vacation and visited various sites that uh, you know, that Ignatius had visited. So I stayed in touch a little bit as, as best I could with the Jesuit community, and I was always fascinated, right, being a history major, that the Jesuits were kicked out of virtually every country in Europe, right? France, England, we kicked out of Germany too, Father? Yeah, that's okay. Germans kick out a lot of people. <laughs> so that fascinated me, and I think as a student at St. Ignatius, that always actually impressed me because I realized that these Jesuits weren't just going along to get along. They were there to make a difference. They were there to do something that may not have been, can I say this, kosher? With the status quo, right? You know what the Jesuits had? Chutzpah. They had chutzpah. And I can say that as a University Heights boy growing up in John Hawkins, my neighbor, way back then, we called it the Gaza Strip, right? Because you're either Catholic or Jewish, so all the kids had chutzpah. We grew up with a little bit of chutzpah. The Jesuits had chutzpah, and that's great, right? And that has filtered down to the thousands of, of young men and women who have enjoyed the Jesuit education. It reminds me of, uh, you know, really reminds me of that famous phrase, many of you have heard this before, I think World War I, Marshal Foch, the French general, who uh, sent a telegram to headquarters, he said, 
My left flank is disintegrating. My middle is crashing. My right flank has lost it. Situation excellent. I shall attack. <laughs> That's the Jesuit mentality. Be dogged, never give up. And I think the success that any of us may have accomplished, whether it's in business or in politics or in education, is really due to that attitude that the Jesuits have provided us. I suppose it's all summarized in the, the one word, and I checked with Father Murphy today to make sure this was theologically accurate. The one word that the Jesuits use, which is magus, Latin for more. Is that right, Latin scholars? Latin for more, which means that we're always looking for the next challenge. There's always something around the bend. There's always more to do, right? Never be satisfied, never, of course, never give up, and never sort of rest on your laurels. There's always more to do. That's a great lesson in today's world. It's great that you're all here to support the Jesuit mission, support the Loyola Club and all the great work that's happening in high schools and colleges around the country. I was very fortunate that my parents figured out how to send me to St. Ignatius. I was very fortunate that I had a chance to spend four years with great teachers and great coaches. I was very fortunate that I paid attention in Mr. Murphy's speech class so that I could do this properly, otherwise he would roll over in his grave. But most importantly, I was very fortunate just to spend four years with some of the greatest people in the world at St. Ignatius High School, and I appreciate you all supporting the Jesuit role in the Jesuit mission. Thank you very much. such great remarks that reflected on Jesuit roots that go way back. We appreciate that. And as a small token of our appreciation, we have a bottle of Einigo wine from the Jesuit winery in uh, Australia. With our thanks and appreciation. Hope you enjoy it. I'm advised we have at least Bill Hunt and a couple other people out in the audience with microphones, so Dave Clifford on that side. So uh, if uh, you have some questions, uh, I'll graciously agree to spend some time answering them. The crowd is stunned, Bill. <laughs> I'm sure that's because of my remarks. Um, uh, I have, I'll start with one question, maybe if you would like to comment on the, uh, as you this morning, a little bit on the realignment uh, in intercollegiate athletics and um, how the conferences are changing and uh, some of the give and take. Well, thank you. There's, there's a lot that's happening in intercollegiate athletics for those that you know, follow college sports. Uh, there is a, what I would call, stratification going on. I had mentioned the top five conferences with the 65 schools. They're, they're literally asking for autonomy from the NCAA to do more with their student athletes, provide more benefits, whether that's stipends or additional educational benefits, travel, vouchers, you name it. Uh, they're sort of moving away. The big schools are moving away from the schools in the Mid-American Conference or the Sun Belt or the Mountain West, there's a, again, a stratification in football going on. Of course, football is really what drives our budgets. Not sure if that's a good or a bad thing, quite honestly. You know, Ohio State, great institution. By the way, uh, we took your president, Gordon E., back to West Virginia with us. So I, Gordon's now my boss, but I refuse to wear bow ties. But Ohio State, if you think about it, quite honestly, has more in common with the Dallas Cowboys than it does with uh, Miami of Ohio in terms of its budgets and facilities and what it's trying to accomplish. So there's a real stratification going on. For years, the NCAA, much like our federal government in Washington, for years, those two entities tried to legislate equality. And you can't really legislate equality. Right? We're all born. You know, we're equal at that point, and then the inequality begins, right? Because some kids have the benefit of going to a great school like St. Ignatius, and they get ahead of the pack, just the way it is. It's life. So for years, the NCAA has tried to legislate equality so that Ohio State or Texas are at the same position as Kent State or the University of Buffalo. 
And there's a realization that it's just not working very well. There's sort of one category of big schools that do have a good bit of money, getting good money from television contracts, et cetera, that can do more for their student athletes. And there's a second set of schools uh, in the smaller conferences that uh, just don't have the financial resources to do that. So that's, that's happening. Uh, it's really gonna affect football more than anything else. Uh, but I tell you, the big five conferences, these power five conferences, they have an enormous hammer vis-a-vis uh, -vis the NCAA. It's kind of like, the, I guess the better analogy would be the Sword of Damocles. They can leave. There's nothing God-given about the NCAA, right? These five conferences could get up and leave and do their own basketball tournament. And it'd be a shame if Butler wasn't in that tournament or Marquette, because those are great programs. But if you talk to the guys at Fox or at ESPN, you know what they really like to show on TV? Kentucky versus Kansas, or Ohio State taking on four. You know, the big schools just have the much bigger brands, and as a result, have a they have a bigger share of, of the market uh, in, in all the major sports. So a lot, a lot of very interesting things happening in, in college athletics. It's really a fun time to be an athletic director, and because we get to sort of be in some crucial meetings in terms of how we decide the the, the future of, of our industry. Is there a question back there? Yes. Wait for the microphone. Uh, Oliver, as a uh, father, a former player, a uh, father of a player right now, um, do you, you know, as the athletic director of the university, do you think that enough is being done about the concussions? And if not, what should be? Concussions is a real legitimate issue in all contact sports, right? Collision sports, football, hockey, lacrosse, even in basketball. You hit the floor, Marty, you coach for, seems like 100 years, right? You hit the floor uh, with, with a kid's head, that floor is rock solid, and it's gonna hurt. So uh, I am very glad that the National Football League, the leader, right? The thought leader in football in this country, has acted in a very progressive fashion to do a whole bunch of research. They're spending, I don't know how many tens of millions of dollars with NIH and others to try to really understand more about concussions. I'm glad that they didn't put their head in the sand like the tobacco companies did for many, many years. Um, it's you know, there's, there's, there's a lot that we don't know about the brain. The federal government is spending over a billion dollars to map the brain. And there are many folks in here that probably know a lot more about this than I do. There's a lot that we don't know, but we're trying to figure that out. I think uh, the high schools, Coach Kyle, you can probably comment on this, and the colleges are, are being very sensitive to the number of contact days that exist in, in the high school and in college football and in the NFL. The NFL only has one contact day a week outside of game day on Sunday. That's happening at the high schools, that's happening at the college level as well. Eventually what we're gonna get to for Pop Warner football, middle school, high school, NFL, college NFL, is gonna be the equivalent of a pitch count for a pitcher, right? You only have so many hits that you should absorb as a, as a player. Uh, but I would also emphasize that it's not just football, it's a problem that exists in a lot of sports. I think the highest percentage of concussions amongst high school athletes, boys and girls, takes place in girls' soccer. Why? Well, they hit the ball, and the theory is a girl's neck is not quite as strong as a boy's neck at that age, and as a result, they get more brain slosh. And a concussion is simply this. Your brain swims in fluid inside of your skull. Your brain is soft tissue. Think about the physics, right? When you get jarred, your brain bumps up against the inside of your skull, and that, that causes damage. The brain can't repair itself very well. So uh, folks are very aware of it. I think it's, uh, it's an issue that's a very hot button topic. A lot of sports are suffering, quite honestly. There are fewer kids playing Pop Warner football in certain parts of the country because mom and dad are saying we're not gonna let Johnny play because we think it might be a, an issue. I had a couple of concussions playing college ball, one in the NFL, probably had one or two playing for St. Ignatius. One of the things we don't know is whether folks are genetically predisposed towards concussions, right? I've been told by a number of neuroscientists that you can take a baseball bat and whack three guys on the head in the exact same spot, exact same force, and they'll have three different responses in terms of their concussion. So there's a lot that we don't know. Caution is, is called for, absolutely. Uh, but I do think it's something that the, the sports world is rallying around to really try to find out what, what best practices are. We certainly wouldn't want kids to play any sport 
knowing they're going to come out of that sport after four years or six years or ten years with you know, severe traumatic brain damage. You're in Cleveland, so you may have predicted that this question would come up. Have we found our savior in Johnny Manziel? <laughs> I'll pass, thank you. He's a, he's a talented kid. You talk about a hoodspot? This kid's got a hoodspot. Somewhere there's a Jesuit tradition in, 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 in this young man, but uh, we'll, we'll see how he plays. I hope he does well. You know, I, I'm, even though I'm obviously a Colts fan, uh, I am somewhat of a Browns fan. I won't be on December 7th when the Colts come to Cleveland to play the Brownies. Yes, Pat. Uh, what do you think about, uh... Pat used to drive me to school every morning when he was a couple years ahead of me in Ignatius. Pat, you were always late. <laughs> Can I just say that? <laughs> yeah, he drove backwards one time. Pat's, Pat's car got stuck in reverse. He drove all the way down Carnegie backwards. Literally. <laughs> Didn't you cut a hole in your rag top and have somebody kind of stick your head? What's your take on uh, playing uh, student athletes? Uh, and if you prefer to pay uh, student athletes in college, how do you determine what kind of stipend to give them if they that? The question is, you know, about paying student athletes. So I would say this. One, I'm opposed, almost everybody in my business is opposed to creating the employer-employee relationship with student athletes because that brings a cascade of unintended consequences like workers' compensation, agents, lockouts, strikes, unions, right? Most of us, though, do agree we should provide stipends to our student athletes. And what that stipend is, is the difference in the value of the scholarship and what it really costs to go to school at Ohio State or Penn State or Indiana or Michigan or wherever, right? It's something that every school has to publicize on its website, which is called the full cost of attendance. And that's usually a couple, $3,000 less than we're allowed to give a kid in terms of the scholarship. Scholarship is the same scholarship that it was in 1950. It's room, books, board, fees. That's it, right? And, and food, and three meals a day. And you know, there are other costs that come in, travel costs. You, gotta, I mean, you can't survive without a cell phone. You can't survive without a laptop in college. So most of us agree that what we should do is try to provide every student athlete, not just the football guys, but you know, the rowers and the women's tennis team and everybody who's on scholarship, that stipend which covers the full cost of attendance. We think that's a smart way to go. For any antitrust lawyers in here, we think that will be legally permissible because we're not setting, we're setting a cap, but there's a reason behind that cap, which is you're providing the, the actual cost of attendance at your institution. That's sort of the way this thing is moving. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Before you gather your question. Over here. Hi, how are you? Um, Having been a former student athlete a couple of decades ago uh, at, a, at a Division I university, and as the 65 top schools battle it out with the NCAA while university budgets tighten up, and you start to hear allegations of no-show classes again, and many football players and basketball players aren't making it through school, um, how do you at West Virginia, since the uh, Jesuits are all about education, and and amongst those 65 schools, try to make sure these athletes are getting through school and getting all the way through school as this all plays out. And there's a lot of big money now. Oh, you mean we have to educate them too? <laughs> I remember going to training table fairly regularly. No, no, no. Well, uh, I'll say this. The schools, big schools and, and smaller ones do an unbelievable job of having academic advisors and tutors and more academic help than any kid can ever want. Right? You have to try to flunk out if you're a football, basketball, soccer, in it, right? Every athlete has access to study halls and, and, and more support than you can possibly need. You want to go to summer school, you need to get a couple of hours, boom, we'll, we'll pay for it. So, Having said that, you know, retention rates at universities are awful, right? Usually, most big state schools have about 25% of the students just in the general student body drop out every year. We find that with athletes. Our graduation rates, not just in West Virginia, but I guarantee you the graduation rates at Ohio State are higher amongst the athletes and amongst the general student body. 
you know. Um, we take in a lot of kids who don't have any real academic preparedness for college. A lot of, you know, truth be told, a lot of remedial courses. You know, one of the refreshing things about talking to an Ignatius kid is you guys are ready for college. You're ready to take physics and calculus and take tough courses. A lot of other kids aren't. You know, when, they, when they're coming out of a lot of public schools and, and whether they're rural areas, in the city areas, there's a real challenge that, that's taking place. It's not just with student athletes, I, I see it across the board. We really do a good job of putting resources behind those kids to get them to graduate. Uh, but, you know, it's the old adage, you can take a horse to water, but well, we try hard. I'll say that. Oliver, uh, tremendous remarks today. The uh, I'll pay you that five bucks now. All right. Uh, Claire Monahan drove in here from Toledo. She's sitting over there, and uh, my nephew Jonathan drove in from Detroit to hear your remarks today. They both graduated this year from college, one from Cincinnati Xavier, one from the University of Michigan. I think they came in part to network, but also look for some wisdom. Uh, your mom's here, she probably gave you all the wisdom you need. Uh, being German, my mom also. Uh, what, what wisdom do you have for maybe Claire and Jonathan, as well as all of our, us with uh, children that are soon to be graduating from college and making their own way? And maybe to borrow a, a word from Chico, uh, how his work is a vocation. Any any thoughts? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the question. I will say congratulations to your nephew and niece for getting out. You know, I mean, seriously, I, and I'll share this with this group. You know, people ask me all the time publicly, "Oh my gosh, Andrew is such a nice young man." And you know, tell us what the secret is, right? And, I don't know what the secret is. I married a great woman, very smart lady, uh, who's very modest herself, right? My friends know my wife, Kathy, who grew up in law school. I never thought my son would be a number one draft pick, right? Had no clue, we just wanted to raise a good kid, you know, that was God-fearing and did well academically. I'm not sure there's any real words of wisdom I can get. I will say this, though, you know, for all young kids just getting out of high school or getting out of college. You know, we live in a great country. We're, we're so fortunate, and I appreciate that most because my mother left a devastated nation to come over to the U.S. We live in a fantastic country. We can do what we want to do. Yeah, we complain and, and bitch, you know, about government and all this sort of stuff. But nonetheless, this is the greatest country in the world. We have more opportunity here than anywhere else in the world. I mean, I can't imagine my son is able to do what he does on a national stage, uh, but he does that because we're in this country. We have phenomenal freedoms, and we've got the Judeo-Christian work ethic, which I think is the most important work ethic in the world. So my only words of wisdom is just be glad you're in America. <laughs> Thank you very much.